Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning for those of our colleagues joining us from the West Coast. And uh, once again, it really is my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone to this third webinar that is really being facilitated and, uh, and really supported by CAFC's Senior Financial Leaders Network. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to the network's chair and colleague, uh, Alan Horsberg, who is a VP, um, senior VP at the IWK Health Center in Halifax. Um, on behalf of CAFC, I really want to welcome all of our colleagues to this webinar um, that is entitled Provision of Health Services Across Provincial Jurisdiction. And we're going to focus on an analysis of cost versus interprovincial billing rates. And, and I know that this is a very, very important and highly relevant topic to many of our member organizations and colleagues from coast to coast. Taking it back to why we are focused in this area, opportunities to share and seek best practices in many different areas of infant, child, and youth health service delivery continue to be a frequent undertaking of many of our colleagues, many of our members uh, from CAFC's national network. As a commitment to all of our members and partners and our stakeholders, we are really pleased to serve as your communication broker. And, um, and we do that in many different ways and through today's example by, by facilitating these webinars that really provide a wonderful venue and opportunity to share best practices across our child and youth health community. About a year ago, just over a year ago, uh, a group of senior financial leaders and health administrators from across Canada created this informal CAFC network with the mandate and vision to share best business and financial practices. And hence, this is the third um, webinar in the series. And, and third sounds like maybe we're, we're going to draw this to a close, but I want to reassure everyone that we are very committed to continuing with this communication strategy and continuing to bring, uh, to bring you, our colleagues that are with us today, uh, to many more events like this to continue to share those important best practices. Without any further ado, it truly is my pleasure, first of all, first and foremost, to thank Alan Horsborough for uh, chairing this, um, this particular network and bringing your expertise to this, Alan. And uh, as I turn things over to Alan, I will also ask you to please introduce our esteemed speakers for today's webinar. So again, welcome, very warm welcome to everyone. And Alan, it's my pleasure to turn over to you. Thank you, Elaine. And, and as the chair of this committee, I'll just uh, make a few brief comments and then and hand it over to our, our colleagues for their presentation. But for a few folks that may be new on the webinar, um, one of the things that we thought as business financial leaders in our pediatric uh, environment that there's a lot of work going on across the province that's absolutely wonderful work and it's a chance and opportunity to share our knowledge amongst one another, especially in light of the challenges we all face with resources and funding and financial issues to advance uh, the care of our pediatric population that every one of us in these roles feel so passionately about. And instead of looking at duplications across the country, why not reach out to one another, both as financial colleagues and our care colleagues on these calls as well, and learn and grow and develop as a community across Canada. And the first two webinars we had, I've already heard great feedback of how others have used and leveraged uh, those conversations from the webinar to advance agendas within their, each of their own organizations. And that really is the ultimate goal from this series and uh, this strategy. So we appreciate the, that there's many folks interested in joining us today. And as Elaine said, encourage folks to submit ideas uh, for future webinars as well. So I will hand it over now to Denise Arsenault 
from Sick Kids and Irene Blaze from Sick Kids, who are going to walk uh, all of us through a very interesting topic that is certainly near and dear to our hearts, with uh, the challenges of the cost of the services that we provide, and how, as a, a pediatric community in Canada, we can tackle some of these issues together. So, Denise and Irene, over to you. Thank you, Doug. Um, it's um, it's my pleasure to uh, to be here today, and I. Uh, with my colleague Irene to um, review with you and share with you some of the results of, the results of some work that we did. Uh, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with our Ministry of Health reps who work on the interprovincial rate uh, front, uh, and uh, it was very clear from the discussions that we had that uh, pediatrics was, let's say, low on the radar for them. Um, sort of at the at the interprovincial table where rates are set, uh, and so uh, we felt that it would be useful to firstly review the with you the results of work that we did here, uh, and to see whether or not we couldn't uh, collectively work to perhaps get this raised uh, up in uh, to the uh, levels that are needed for the interprovincial table to address some issues that we're finding. Uh, specifically with respect to pediatrics. Uh, I, I thought that uh, it would be uh, helpful perhaps for those of you who may not have the background, although it will be uh, certainly uh, well known to many of you, just to review kind of how the interprovincial uh, arena works and to review kind of the methodology that is used in setting those rates. Um, we at Sick Kids, as most of you know, are one of the um, case costing hospitals, and Irene, uh, in her role as director of decision support, uh, leads the group that uh, th that does that work. And so, um, we thought that for those of you who aren't part of that, and just because we have relied on that methodology to do the analysis, that it would be useful just to give you kind of a, a very high level overview of that. And then to walk you through the process that we went through in reviewing kind of the cost of delivering the services against the rates and what our conclusions were, uh, and then to have some discussions about where you know kind of where we might go from here given this reality. So uh, so firstly, I think most of you know that sort of with our insurance uh, public health insurance program that as we move from province to province or visit other provinces, that our services, our health services, are provided and we get our out-of-province re revenues uh, when we deliver services there. And indeed, the agreements that are reached across the provinces are by intention and intended to cover kind of those, those services and to give us kind of the cost, the cost recovery against that. And it's managed through an interprovincial committee um, at which we all have representatives. The rates for inpatients are calculated using the CIHI data and are intended to cover, are calculated to cover both direct costs and the appropriate proportion of indirect costs. And you see kind of the different rates that are set kind of just, you know, on, on the page, sort of the regular inpatient rates. There's an ICU rate as well that is separate, um, along with other kind of specific rates for different uh, procedures. On the outpatient side, uh, this is the area where we have kind of, I'll say, sort of some, some specific issues because it's one rate for both adults and for peds. Sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, further, uh, and this is an area that we have certainly found there to be some issues, you're only allowed to bill one outpatient activity per day. And the difficulty that we find with that is that when we have referred in patients from other provinces, we work, I'll say, kind of doubly hard to schedule their procedures or their visits in one day so that they can get home as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, sort of the, the, the more activities we do in one day, the more we end up having a loss from those visits. 
and, and you see sort of um, listed um, on this slide the various different rates that exist kind of by, by procedure type. So, so that, that's a quick overview, and maybe I could just pause in case there are any questions sort of about kind of the overall interprovincial arena. I, I, uh, if there are, I can discuss now. I think it's fairly uh, well known to people. So uh, Irene, I'll ask you to um, walk through the methodology, please. So um, the costing used for the uh, analysis that we provided um, and completed um, was using the Ontario case costing methodology. Uh, the SICK hits is part of the OCCI, as it's called, um, one of 48 uh, hospitals currently in the um, OCCI database. Um, there is a very robust standard uh, methodology that we all have to apply. And it's a system that brings together all of the statistics, uh, financial and patient descriptive and utilization data. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. The system costs out patient activity and utilization across the continuum of care. So uh, by that we mean that um, it does cost um, all of the activity from the inpatient unit and the nursing care on that unit to the pharmacy, DI lab, et cetera. Um, and also encompasses in the methodology any um, ambulatory costs that are um, incurred during an inpatient visit. So for example, if a patient is an inpatient and is well enough to receive dialysis in the dialysis unit, um, as opposed to having the dialysis unit come to the bedside, um, that's an ambulatory area that would be reporting costs, but we would also be able to cost that fully uh, in that inpatient encounter. Um, the Ontario case costing methodology is based on workload measurement, and by that we mean that the um, weighting given to all of the costs in a functional center is based on the patient's workload. So if a patient um, receives um, a one-to-one -one nursing assignment, and that is reported in the workload system, um, and another patient receives a one-to-four nursing assignment, one patient will receive one-fourth of the, of the, admit, of the, um, of the uh, fixed cost that the other patients would receive, for example. Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care receives hospital-specific data annually through the OCCI database. And that is used externally um, for costing, for funding, and calibration of case weights. Uh, the OCCI database does get to CHI-HI on an annual basis, and it's part of uh, calibration for the um, resource intensity weights on an annual basis. And internally, I have to tell you, we use this information a whole lot for our various initiatives from feasibility and impact analysis to efficiency analysis, quality initiatives, benchmarking, out-of-country pricing, and of course this out-of-province analysis is done on an annual basis. What you have on the next slide is a brief summary of um, all of the, the, um, the intake into the case costing system. There are 18 uh, feeders, what we call uh, extracts, going into the case costing system on a monthly basis. Um, we work very hard on relationships with our custodians, our data custodians, on compliance. We have an over 80% compliance on our nursing workload on the inpatient side, as well as most of our professional services are 80 plus in terms of productivity and compliance. So the data that we use is well-founded, and we are therefore very confident and comfortable in analyzing revenue against that cost data on an ongoing basis. So the process that we used for this exercise uh, was to take our, our two years of data. We will be doing this exercise again with the third year. We are currently just uh, wrapping up our annual CCI audit um, reports with the ministry, and as soon as that's complete, we'll be doing the third year of analysis where we compare patient by patient, 
our um, cost for those patients against the billing that we were able to um, to report and record based on the interprovincial agreement. Um, so again, very important to note the analysis is completed both from a costing and a revenue perspective on a patient uh, level. Okay. Specific patient. Specific patient, yes. Yeah. So overall, we have um, some findings, six themes, I guess you could call them, where we find that the billing um, on the inpatient per day is showing weaknesses when you look at a per diem, which is applied across all inpatients, uh, whether they are surgical, medical, mental health, uh, obstetrics, etc. We get the same per diem, and what we're finding is that we have where uh, high cost surgical cases, I gave you two examples, plastic surgery, cardiology, we have some neurology examples as well, where our costs were more for that patient than the, the billing allowed under the, um, the per diem for that uh, specific year we were looking at. The other finding is that if the patient is in, from an out of province patient is in for a short time and needs surgery, that one per diem, uh, that one day length of stay or two day length of stay is just not enough to cover both the inpatient stay and the OR uh, cost. The third finding is that the day surgery rate of $1,000 is, is usually not enough. And most of our day surgery cases for out of province is uh, ophthalmology. The one large area of discrepancy, and, and, and that's happening um, as a result, any cath lab um, cardiac catheterization procedure, be it outpatient or part of the inpatient bucket as a high cost, is, is the theme. Uh, we are not recovering uh, the dollars we need to recover for that. So especially um, if that cath lab is interventional as opposed to diagnostic. Um, so if we are, you know, inserting a stent for a, a VSD um, in the cath lab, there's the cost of the device. Um, there's, and in some cases, two devices because pediatric patients sometimes um, the surgeon does his best, his or her best to uh, judge the size of the stent, and we have a number of cases where they end up using two stents before they have the right size. So this area is a very large area of concern where we are not recovering uh, our full cost. Diagnostic imaging, here's the theme where uh, you have a pediatric component very much so it's um, all of the cases where we have CT, MR, I, um, where the patient requires sedation or, gen or GA, general anesthesia, we noted that uh, we could not recover our cost based on that one billing rate. Um, and uh, the final one is at SickKids we have an image guided therapy uh, unit, and it's not directly li listed um, as a one of the diagnostic procedures or interventional procedures in the um, ministry uh, list. It, we're currently billing it at the CT rate because that's the best rate to bill it at, um, not because it's, it's still considered a diagnostic cost center. And um, we looked at billing it at a short stay surgical case rate, but because it's not the right functional center in the MIS, um, it's not considered a diagnostic. So again, an area to, to pursue with, uh, with the interprovincial. Um, so we do uh, biopsies, pick line insertions. Uh, one of the large uh, variances we found were cases that were coming in for myelograms, which are biopsies of uh, the spinal cord. Um, so again, an area of consideration where, um, especially for pediatric teaching hospitals, where some of the standards of care may be uh, moving more quickly than um, the, they are changing the billing, um, the billing methodology. That list of billing codes on the outpatient slide that uh, Denise talked about, was in fact uh, has not changed in the 10 plus years that um, uh, you know I've been at the kids. So these are the main findings of our analysis. So um, 
so we're, we're, we are clear over, overall that right now, you know, and, and we know we wouldn't be alone because certainly there are other pediatric hospitals that are providing these types of services and uh, we don't we don't expect that uh, their their procedures would be um, done in such a different way that it would change the, their conclusions. Um, I, I don't know whether any of those you know whether any of you are case costing hospitals, and it could be interesting to perhaps compare notes if if you are. Um, but this overall was an area that it was clear to us. You know, sort of that right now, if you'd like, kind of, you know, we are we, we are we are in trouble, and we realized that there were two routes that we could go. You know, sort of on a case by case basis before we would accept an out of province. Uh, you know, these these for the most part are cases that are I'll say elective in their scheduled cases, and we could you know intervene in each case and do kind of you know one off negotiations with the, with respect to the patient to require that the province agree to a different rate uh, and and indeed you know sort of that's on our options list um, because it you know it, it doesn't make sense for us kind of in the to be doing it at, in a way that isn't recovering the cost but obviously the best route I would think is to use kind of the efficient system of the out of province kind of billing table to get to get this um, addressed and so um, I don't know before we move on to the questions to see whether or not there are any questions for Irene with respect to the analysis that was done and and Doug perhaps I should could ask you just to see whether there are. Yeah, we haven't had any questions come in yet, uh, so that's just a reminder for folks to just you know type in any questions that you have. Be sure to type them into the uh, into the question box, and we'll pass them along to the speakers. Okay. So uh, as I say when we were doing this work. Sort of, you know, we 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 at Sick Kids were thinking that kind of our ideal route to addressing this issue was through the interprovincial table, uh, but indeed uh, we have a couple of questions for for the participants, uh, and that is to see whether or not there is a consensus about that. And so, uh, you know, for, first the first question that we thought it might be useful to pose is whether or not there is agreement that the rates should cover the cost of delivering pediatric services. Um, and, and secondly, if we do agree with that, whether or not um, people in their individual provinces were willing to help advocate with their ministry reps to have these issues uh, addressed. So we are just we are just going to launch a poll here that's going and this is going to allow everyone to uh, to make a selection on their screen and 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 answer the question. So the first question, as uh, Denise mentioned, is should the out of province rates cover the cost of delivering pediatric services? And uh, we'll give everyone a chance to uh, put in an answer here. We'll give everyone a few more seconds here. Denise, it's it's Alan at the IWK. I wonder while folks are answering this questionnaire, if you could add some clarity to your conversation with the Ministry of Health and what they articulated to you as why this particular issue has been a challenge uh, for the Ministry in dealing with the pediatric rates uh, uh, more applicable to the real cost in the interprovincial billings. Well, you know, in the conversation that we had, um, you know, we, I think honestly we were bringing something to their attention for the first time. Um, they. You know, I, I, I certainly imagine that you know, the issue you know, is that PEDS is relatively small in the overall scheme of things, and so while it creates a problem for those hospitals that serve as you know, uh, national centers, let's call them, sort of for the delivery of services, uh, you know, that I don't know that they had this brought to their attention in the past, but indeed, you know, sort of not every province is um, a national site for uh, these types of services. And so um, there will be a process they need to go through by which they achieve agreement across the provinces for changes in rates. Uh, and so it certainly was our feeling that the mechanism 
would have to be one by which, or would, would be most successful if the pediatric hospitals were supportive of kind of the acknowledgement that pediatric services, you know, cost more um, in cases. And certainly, uh, I would just share that we in Ontario have had you know, some success uh, recently in getting this explicitly acknowledged. And the example that we have is that there is some specific funding for MRI services. And last year, we were able to get a different rate set for MRIs requiring um, sedation, general anesthetic. Um, there was, you know, we, we used our case costing data to demonstrate to them that we were not able to deliver the services at the rate per procedure that they were offering. And they gave us a kind of a, a variance in rate, a higher rate for those MRIs uh, that require GA. Because one one yeah. of the comments that um, I, I can also add is that the the sense at the interprovincial table and and I um, and I you know it's also in one of the QA uh, documents for the uh, interprovincial billing is that um, the the uh, billing the per diem that's calculated on the inpatient side is calculated using our own information. So it's done using our own MIS information. So the sense is that it's representing your hospital. And it may be from an average perspective, an average patient perspective, mm -hmm. but most of us seeing out-of-province patients are not seeing the average okay. patients coming from mm -hmm. outside of yeah, our province. So they are see we are seeing the higher cost, the higher surgical case and complex cases that are mm -hmm. un unwell enough or to where services may not be available out of province. So an average per diem may not be um, mm -hmm. the right um, the right route for those of us that are um, academic teaching hospitals uh, treating out of province patients. And that certainly is, I think, the, the explanation for some of the, the, the high cost surgical cases and the short stay surgical cases. Because you, like averages don't work for the nature of the referred cases. Well, there's also, and some folks on the on the webinar may be familiar with this, and some may not be, but there's also a political and administrative uh, situation here causing part of this problem. Uh, before I came to the IWK Health Center, I was the chief financial officer at the Ministry of Health in Nova Scotia dealing with this very issue. And what, unless the model has changed since I left, what uh, happens in establishing interprovincial billing rates between the provinces is there is the committee that gets together and looks at all these things and, and hopefully looks at a lot of this evidence. They're familiar with much of it, but not all of it. But there's three provinces that have more net recipient patients in from other provinces than they, sh they have uh, shipped out to other provinces. And that is Nova Scotia, Ontario, and Alberta. But the committee, when they're looking at establishing the rates, they all have equal votes, equal say. So naturally, given the fact that the administrative structure of interprovincial billings flows through the ministry as opposed to directly hospital to hospital in all cases, the provinces who would be winding up having a bigger bill uh, are reluctant to vote for rate increases because it's going to cost them more. So trying to get adjustments for these high cost procedures in these tertiary centers for the highest and sickest uh, patients, adults and, and, and children, has been a, a administrative and political struggle in this process. So when we start to talk about some of your questions here and how we're going to addre address this as pediatric centers who are, are standalone and how we get reimbursed, uh, this is going to be an important conversation in our approach. Well, and Alan, you know, as I said, you know, sort of we're, uh, we are certainly, we, we have at times when we've had some very expensive patients, so um, a, a particular, particular challenging patient, we have gone back to the sending provinces uh, and negotiated um, a special, special rates at times. But we've done so in the uh, ridiculous cases, let's say, where we would otherwise be losing our shirt kind of thing in a way that we just couldn't responsibly do. 
And what this analysis has done for us is made it clearer to us that this is um, more substantive than we understood, number one, and that secondly, we should be not receiving these patients without, uh, without doing some kind of work in order to ensure that we are being appropriately compensated. And, and so, you know, that, that is not what we want to do from a patient care perspective. You know, you want to facilitate the, you know, kind of the appropriate retrieval of these patients, you know, um, for the right care to be provided. And, and you know, we, we acknowledge that sick kids has, you know, as do some, you know, as do others in particular areas. We have an expertise and, uh, you know, a highly specialized program that it, this is the right Canadian solution. And this is where I think really where you're leading with your questions, that if we as a pediatric uh, community across Canada can stand united on the fact that we are treating the sickest of the sick children and that it does impact each and every one of our budgets and how we are funded provincially and how we receive these patients, uh, a united approach can hopefully help get this uh, issue addressed for these rates to be adjusted more broadly than having to constantly go to the super one-off expensive ones, which are a lot of time and energy, and let's get yeah. the main population overall focused on via a rate increase as reflective of the actual cost. Exactly. So, Doug, I'll hand it back to you for, you know, helping uh, Irene and Denise through the uh, questions, but just wanted to have that conversation while uh, folks were voting. Yeah, no, I thought that was, that was a great conversation. So we have flipped the results around. So 89% of people said, uh, yes, the, they should cover the cost of delivering the services. And there's 11% of the uh, respondents said unsure. And if anyone out there who said unsure uh, wants to put in a comment as to, uh, you know, if there's any clarification or, or why you're unsure then feel free to put that in the comments. We do have a few questions that have lined up into the hopper here, and uh, we might as well just uh, move on to the next poll question, get that out of the way, and then we'll uh, go to the questions. So the second question uh, was, uh, if, if you answered yes, that they should cover the costs, uh, would you be willing to help advocate with your ministry representatives to address the rate issue identified? So we'll just give people a chance to, to express their willingness to, uh, to get involved and, and, and advocate on, on this issue. And I'm also curious if in addition to advocating with the ministry, who are the ones that coordinate this process, if also there's an awareness opportunity here through CHA or some of our other health association memberships, CAPC clearly, uh, in certain uh, venues and audiences that can also kind of represent this issue on our behalf. It's a good question. Because I think part of the issue is certainly awareness, and the mm -hmm. more folks hear of the issue, certainly the more the ministries will be inclined to help listen and, and help solve our problem as well. Yeah. And, you know, Doug, I, uh, I expect that it's more of an issue, right, Can it proportion, it's more of an issue in PEDS overall just because of the small population, right? Like you can't add a, you know, for the population is too small in the number of cases to, for it to make sense to develop right, kind of a, a program um, for the, some of the quaternary or tertiary even care that is, uh, is required. Absolutely. All right, so we'll just close off this poll and we'll uh, take a look at the results here. So we've got 64% uh, said yes, they'd be willing to get involved. 7% uh, said no, and again, 29% unsure. And, Again, with those unsure folks or the no folks uh, person, uh, feel free to put in a comment and just you know maybe give us a bit of a, an explanation if you uh, are interested in letting us know why. Um, so uh, for uh, this may be for Irene and this and and I think Denise, you might have you in one of your comments you might have addressed this, but uh, Kim has asked what was the total revenue to total cost, and she's suggesting that one would expect that some would gain money and some would lose money, and maybe you're ending up at a at a at a reasonable average in in the end. But uh, I think you, you did sort of comment at least in part on this, but uh, maybe a little, little more on, this, on that question. Yeah. So the, uh, for many of the inpatient cases, when you put the pluses and the minuses together, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, there's, never, you know, there's never one rate per case. In the others, they were, uh, they were generally okay. They were, we, didn't, we weren't um, going to the bank uh, with the profit. 
uh, and there were some there were some cases that were losses and others that were gained, but overall we were covered, right? Okay. So, so overall we were covered on the inpatient side, um, but not on the ambulatory side on right. the outpatient. So that is our biggest challenge is on the ambulatory side, but overall the uh, where the inpatient, we were, were not recovering our costs, it was substantial. They were, you know, again, the high cost ones were substantive. So those ones that were, that were identified, so. I'll give you an example. On the bone marrow transplant cases, the, the uh, transplant, the interprovincial billing methodology per, says that if you're getting one bone marrow transplant, and your length of stay is greater than X number of days, and it changes depending on the type of transplant you receive, then you go into a per diem mode so that you have a one-time uh, billing for the transplant itself, the perioperative uh, or the peritransplant episode. And then if you cross it over into the threshold of a longer length of stay, then after a certain number of days, um, you're able to uh, capture per diem for each of those days. We've been arguing at length that we need the same thing on the transplant, on the solid organ transplant side, and that's not happened. So a patient can be here for, you know, up to a year sometimes, and, and that, those are the extraordinary cases that, um, that um, Denise talked about. Uh, there isn't that same uh, uh, methodology where you know, if you're here more than X number of days, uh, then we go into a per diem mode. So in some cases, the reality is that the methodology itself could be tweaked. In some cases, it's also a rate adjustment. Great, thanks, Irene. Um, we've got a couple questions from Navid from uh, London Health Sciences. Uh, his first question is, and again, I think this was uh, during, this came in during Irene's uh, portion, uh, what is the workflow of your data audit process? The workflow of our data audit process. So we have a data audit process with each one of our data custodians. Um, so individually at, at month's end, um, before we load the data, we get the extract. It's loaded into, uh, if you're from London you and you're a case costing hospital, I know it's loaded into the loader part. And before it's published, it's, uh, the, the totals um, are audited back to, uh, to the main system. And, um, uh, you know, and any uh, rejects are dealt with before publication of that data. Um, we also have an annual, uh, robust annual uh, case costing OCCI ministry uh, process that we're in the middle of. And um, thirdly, we also work with the various programs um, on their, their main procedures, their main patient type, et cetera, to do um, significant reliability testing um, on an annual basis. And um, so we have three processes for data quality. And I, I do have a, a very robust data quality presentation that, that, I've, give, that I've given um, internationally as well to international case costing groups uh, if uh, anyone is interested in seeing that we can share that. All right uh, and the second question he had was uh, he, he says you did mention that you have 18 feeders that go automatically from healthcare systems uh, and and he's asking do you have feeders which are not currently available in your case costing system? Uh, yes we, uh, before your data is accepted in the Ontario Case Costing database, you have to reach a threshold. So you can't send data uh, that only costs 50% of your inpatient activity and say, here's our inpatient cost. So we have to have, the threshold is over 90% of our costs being included. We have some small um, costing systems, uh, i.e. pathology being one of them, where we're working on um, uh, the inability to get data from the from the system out in uh, in a format that we can uh, go, uh, we can then load. So we have a couple of other systems that we're working with, but we are certainly over the ninety percent threshold in terms of costing a full inpatient encounter. 
So in the case of pathology, Irene, maybe you can explain to people what, what, how the case costing methodology works where you don't actually have a feed of the actual. Where it does not have a feed of the actual, um, if, and, and that's why we're so robust about making sure we do, is that it's then applied from a per diem perspective or excluded totally. So um, ministry lets us exclude it totally rather than jeopardize the full costing of all patients. So uh, I, for us, it's excluded. All right, well, that's, uh, that's all the questions we have right now in the list. And, and if anyone else has any questions or any other additional comments come to mind after this discussion, um, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Denise Allen and, uh, and Irene for any further comments on this. Well, Alan, I, I wonder whether or not you might um, lead the discussion about what are the right next steps then, since there seems to be a consensus. <laughs> My phone just died. I mean, I just came back in. So if you want to just uh, repeat what I missed for about the last three minutes, I'll happily lead the conversation. My apologies. Well, I, that's that's it. Were you there for the um, survey questions to see the results of the uh, willingness to uh, advocate? Yes. Yeah. So I th we've just been um, answering some questions around case costing. So uh, relative to this topic, you didn't miss anything. Um, but the, uh, the final, I guess the, the final step then for us, and you, you perhaps started this a little bit already, Alan, uh, what is really a discussion then of what are the appropriate next steps for us, uh, given that we have identified overall kind of, a, kind of an acceptance that the out-of-province rates should cover the cost of delivering pediatric services, and that kind of, you know, two-thirds of the participants indicated that they would be willing to advocate. Uh, you, you identified some other techniques that might be used, and I think they seem very wise. So I wonder whether we might just to get some agreement on what are the right, what are the right next steps. No, I think, uh, I, I find certainly, and the whole reason for this conversation is a united voice stands far stronger than several individual voices. So throw this out there, if we're to take an approach, maybe the United approach might work. Uh, maybe a common uh, developed letter that we could all sign off on and then send to our individual ministries. Uh, a, a briefing note uh, that can be developed by a handful of us that can be sent to CHA and CAFC that can be included in uh, various audiences and briefings of others when they meet with uh, politicians and, and, and senior bureaucrats in the ministry and so on. But I, I kind of throw out there for conversation if, if folks were, and those that wanted to could sign on board to a common letter and those that were not comfortable certainly would not have to do that. But I do see a united voice having a, a greater say and a greater impact if all the ministries receive the same kind of thing from all of us together. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think that that's right. And if we could be successful, maybe CAF C is the right is uh, would be the right place, and we may even be able to get kind of uh, something signed up um, during the conference, right? Yes. Like through the questions, you know, uh, I'd be interested if any folks have concerns or are okay with. Uh, if a few of us through Doug and Denise and myself drafted up a, a short briefing, uh, you know, advocacy, educational type of uh, message that we could send to our ministry uh, counterparts in each of our province, would folks be okay with signing on board on that electronically or at the conference or however? Yeah, I mean that's certainly something that we we could do. Uh, we 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 have the list, the the contact na uh, addresses for all of the people attending this webinar, as well as the, the the other folks that sit on the senior financial leaders network that participate in those regular calls. So we could certainly, I think, draft something and distribute it through this group and see who's willing to uh, sign on or or help push it forward in their their jurisdictions. If anyone else wants to just type into the question box, just type in what, you know whether you think uh, this is a good idea or if you have any other suggestions, feel free to uh, just type those into the question box. Because we all have our individual relationships with our respective provincial ministries of health, 
However, there's several things going on now between the National Health Accord that's being developed, so the timing for awareness is certainly there with uh, them consulting various audiences, which our population certainly should be one as a pediatric national uh, organizations. They, you know, the, the CHA, the CAFC, I think that we have opportunities here to have our voice heard. And uh, the last thing that these health leaders and politicians would ever want to see happen, and it's not, and that's not why we do our job, is to see uh, patient care hurt just because of major budget inequities. And this is something that we believe is is going to enhance and keep this patient care population being served to help us address these issues. Because at the end of the day, through our provincial funding streams, if we can't get some of these costs as they continue to grow and the rates continue to stay stagnant, budget impacts are going to hurt our organizations. It may not be these patients, but it certainly will be others as we have to right size our budget to stay whole. So I think it's in the interest of all that we serve um, that we try to have this issue addressed. We did have a question come in from Kim, and she's wondering, and, and I think, uh, Denise, you might have touched on this at the beginning, at least mentioning that you have some examples of cases that were sort of unique to uh, pediatrics in this, in this instance. But she's wondering if, if the issues with ambulatory care are, in fact, unique to pediatrics, or if you are aware of sort of the breadth of this issue. Is this something that uh, affects all populations, or is it more of an impact on the pediatric centers? Well, we, gave, you know, we did give the examples of, uh, you know, certainly the need for general anesthetic in peds is different than it is in adults. And so that's one really tangible example. So it would not be too many adults who, for example, in having an MRI would require sedation. So that, that is um, a situation that is indeed unique um, to kids. The other way in which I think uh, there is a variance between peds and adult is the, 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 because of the small volume, the number of times when it doesn't make sense to deliver uh, a particular kind of care in province is probably higher. Right, just because of small volumes, right? Where with the adults, more of the many more of the cases are going to be sufficient that there would be a site within the province that where it makes sense, you know, sort of in the in the teaching hospital um, in the province to deliver the care. Some of the um, high cost cases that we're seeing are very pediatric specific. So I'll give you examples. Um, um, the plastic, um, the craniofacial cases, where um, the kids are coming from across the country, um, are very uh, focused on pediatric um, anomalies um, around, you know, facial and, and head uh, issues. Some of the cardiology cases. So if you're doing a stent in the cath lab, um, you know, you're you're repairing a baby's uh, heart. Um, the hole in the baby's heart. So uh, again, they're, they're very specific uh, types of procedures and needs to the pediatric world. I think it might be useful for us to paint a better, you know, paint uh, some of ex those examples more clearly. And, and we, can, we can do that. Um, and we can also, you know, paint the you know, the, the example of where, for a particular case, the pediatric treatment is different than for an adult and, and more expensive for kids than for an adult, like, like my example of the MRI requiring sedation for peds. We did get another uh, question come in um, from Michael, and he's, he's asking, are there any quick wins that you can suggest while working with the current structure of the reciprocal billing process? For example, could you suggest one or two additional codes that might resolve much of the issues? So I, I think that, that there, are, uh, there are indeed ways in which uh, we, can, we can do that. I think, Michael, that you're absolutely right, that we don't have to, uh, we don't have to in some cases, um, it make it complex. You know, we could ask for, you know, sort of a, um, there to be, for example, an MRI with sedation, right, or requiring general anesthetic codes. Yeah. 
as in cath lab, right? So, so there, are, there are ways in which I think asking for a review of the list is, is a solution. I agree with you. So if you look and, and I expect that that requirement is probably something that would be also true on the adult side, that they will have some you know, kind of complex cases that aren't covered really, aren't contemplated. Um, the interventional procedures is, is a good example of that, right? So, you know, what, what we know right now is that we already, we should not be using the CT code. We should be updating it at least to use the day surgery code, which is, I think, the more, the more appropriate comparator. It would reduce the amount of the loss. We don't have any other questions uh, on the list right now. I'm not sure if there's any other uh, comments from our panelists here, if we want to wait for some more questions or if we, if we think we've... No, I think that, that's terrific. Well, listen, folks, uh, we will uh, go offline and talk about a uh, national response approach that we could collectively sign on to and then hopefully each one of us in our roles and capacities and working with the ministries of health in our province uh, create this awareness and pass this information along through this joint letter and we will work with Denise and Doug and Capsi to do that. I would like to thank Denise and Irene for taking the time out of their busy day and everyone on the, uh, on the webinar for taking time out of your day too to help us collectively advance this agenda. It's very important and uh, will make a big difference for every one of our organizations. So I would also remind everyone, please send in some topics to Doug and myself for future webinars that we could all benefit from. And uh, we would love to have another host province and, and organization uh, join on for the next webinar. And thank you all, and have a great afternoon, great morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Denise and Irene. Again, a great presentation, and as I mentioned at the top of the uh, webinar, this will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org sometime within the next week or two. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me at dmaynard.cafc.org. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and we'll hopefully see you on the next webinar.